Okay, good morning. Um, we have a Gemaras in front of you, as well as on the screen. Today, we're going to go through a little bit of the questions that we asked yesterday and a little bit Siddic explanations on this part of the story of the Megillah. Um, a lot of strong questions that are asked. The Gemara yesterday was detailing the responses back and forth between Mordechai and Esther through a messenger called Hasach. Esther told Mordechai, gather all the Jews together, fast for me three days and three nights, in order that the decree should be abolished. I should be successful in order to intercede with the king. And she told Mordechai that once I go to Hashredesh of my own free will, I will now be prohibited to Hashredesh forever. To you forever. Until now, I was permitted to you because I was forced to be with Hashredesh. From now on, I will be prohibited to be with you because I was with Hashredesh of my own free will. And then she says the words, Kashem, Vekasher Avaditi, Avaditi. I will come to the king without permission. And if I am lost, I am lost. Meaning, just like I am lost from my father's house, I will no longer be keeping my secret that I am Jewish. I will no longer be Tznias. I will no longer be, be allowed to be married to you. Kach oven mimecha, so too I will be separated from you. Because she will be prohibited now to Achashredish once, once to Mordechai, once she was with Achashredish of her own free will. Tosis over here asked an interesting question. How come Mordechai couldn't just give her a divorce? Just divorce her. And then afterwards, whatever she does, she does when she's not married. And later on, she'll be permitted to marry to Mordechai again. So why didn't Mordechai preempt her and give her a divorce? Mordechai wasn't a claim. It was from Benjamin. So Tosis gives an interesting answer. He says, when you're dealing with a king, you can't play around. And by a get, by a divorce, you need to have witnesses, Adam. Once other people know about it, once other people have witnesses to the fact, no matter who they are, word's going to get out. And therefore, Mordechai was, was afraid about that it will become publicized what he did. But the question is, and many people ask different uh, questions on that, there's different ways of getting around that. Bilaf was a little concerned to go with Sarah. Yeah. So she was Abraham's wife. Uh huh. So Achasheresh would not have been so also concerned that she was Mordechai's wife? Um, he didn't have a dream? He, yeah, like, 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 like Mike says, he didn't have a dream. Yossi Vokertov. He didn't have a dream. Okay, so Baruch Hashem, kol yom. Baruch Hashem, so happy to hear. Yeah, he didn't have a dream in the same manner, saying that, uh, you know, if you touch Esther, you're going to be, you're going to die. But there's, there are methods around it. For example, if the husband writes an entire divorce in his own handwriting, and later on witnesses could verify the handwriting. Um, the Rajba asked this question on Tosfos. The Rajba, one of the Rishonim, Mishmul ben Deres. And so Mordechai, so actually it says that he, in, in there's certain way, things he could have done. Either write a handwritten divorce for her every single day. Or another thing he could have done is since Mordechai had the ability to divorce her with witnesses, he didn't do it because of a technical reason, but any other form of divorce would not have been valid. But we do see from here in Halakha that the fact that Tosis asked this question, a man is allowed to divorce his wife for reasons other than not getting along. Because the Christians ask, why couldn't Mordechai divorce um, Esther and then be allowed to remarry her after instead of being prohibited to Mordechai forever? So there are cases, for example, if a um, husband is old and he's passing away and he doesn't want his wife to have to marry his brother, if they have no children, a Yavam, he's allowed to marry her, divorce her before um, the, he passes away. 
he's not divorcing her out of um, dislike, out of not getting along, but he's divorcing her for other reasons out of love for her. He doesn't want her to get married to his brother. She doesn't want to marry. Maybe she doesn't want to marry the brother. So then, if we see from the it is per, it is permitted. Let's dis uh, discuss it a little bit over here. Uh, the back and forth was going on between Esther and Mordechai. Haman made a decree to all the Jews should be killed in one day. It says right at the beginning, the first words of the of the of the paragraph are Mordechai Yadas Kolashar Nasa. Mordechai found out everything that happened. How did Mordechai found out? So look at Rashi over here. He says, Balachaloim Amarloi. The master of dreams told Mordechai, that in heaven, this is the decree that there should be a decree of destruction for the Jewish people. Because they bowed to the idol during the days of Nebuchadnezzar. And they had benefit, enjoyment from the feast of Achashredish. So this is how Rashi brings down. He, Mordechai was told this in a dream. The Targum over here. Uh, the, the Aramaic translation writes, Ayada de Eliyahu, Eliyahu Anabi, was the one who told Mordechai about the decree. There's a different Targum which says, Beruach HaKodesh, you saw it with prophecy. So what's the difference of all these different um, opinions? So the day that Haman made a decree against the Jewish uh, to destroy the Jews was on the 13th of Nisan. Says, on Yud Gimel Nisan, that's the day that Haman made the lottery. Right afterwards, he goes to the king and says, the king, I want to destroy the Jews. That day, the king makes a decree. And right afterwards, Mordechai finds out and he starts fasting and putting on sackcloth and ashes. And then he has a discussion back and forth with Esther. And then B Esther tells him, make a fast for three days. When did these, when did the fast of the three days take place? So look over here in Rashi, in verse 17. It says, Vayavra Mordechai, Mordechai passed. Vayas chahol asher tzivta love Esther. And he did according to everything Esther commanded him. We're going to see in the Gemara, he passed over the river. But Rashi says, Vayavra, he transgressed. From the term Avera. Mordechai transgressed. What did he transgress? A sin. He fasted on the first day of Pesach. He made a three-day fast. The 14th of other, of Nisan, the 15th of Nisan, and the 16th of, of Nisan. And he made it, the Jews are now, will now have to fast on Pesach itself. Because the 13th of Nisan, is a day that the lots were made when the decree was made. And the fast was on the 14th, 15th, and 16th of Nisan. So that's what Rashi says. The Medrash actually brings down differently. The three days of the fast were not the 14th, 15th, and 16th of Nisan, but rather 13th of, of, of Nisan, 14th of Nisan, and 15th of Nisan. Meaning the day that Haman made the decree, the next day and the last day of the fast was the first day of Pesach. So two different opinions. This is Mr. Shapiro asked yesterday. When, what days were the fast? So there's two opinions. According to Rashi, it was 14, 15, 16th of Nisan. According to the Medrash, it was 13, 14, and 15th of Nisan. These disagreements actually come one from the other. Who, how did Mordechai find out about this news? That Haman made the decree. So in the very beginning of the parak, it says, Rashi says, Bala Chalayim, he was told in a dream. When does a person sleep, generally? By night. So Mordechai was told during his dream, meaning he was told by night. So the decree took place on the 13th, the writing of the, of the decree took place on the 13th of Nisan. Mordechai was only told that night in his dream on the 14th of Nisan. So then he established a fast on 
14, 15, and 16, according to Rashi. So therefore, it makes sense if he was told in a dream, according to Rashi, the fast was on the 14th, 15th, and 16th of Nisan. According to the Targum, which Mordechai found out about the writing of the decree through Ruach HaKodesh prophecy, or Elio Navi. So then he found out already on the 13th of Nisan, on the day that the decree was written. And then con consequently, that day he already declared a fast. So therefore, according to the Targum, the fast was on the 13th, 14th, and 15th of Nisan. I actually had a mice with the Bala Chalimus. You had a story with the Bala Chalimus. Let's share. So my son and I are working on this genealogical project. Mm -hmm. And two of my father's uncles, Uncle Marcus and Uncle Julius, yeah. uh, left Europe and went to Buenos Aires in 1909. And my son is a mumch at finding ship manifests, and he could not find them for these two guys. I told him, see, when they left Europe, the names were not Marcus and Julius. <laughs> to find out what their Yiddish name was. So um, Julius is buried in Brooklyn, in, 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 in Queens, in, in, in the original society cemetery plots. His name was Asher Zelli. Marcus lived and died in Brazil. After he was in Argentina, he went to Brazil. We never knew anything about him. So I told him, put in, the, put in, the, in your search engine, for Julius, put either Osha or Zelig. And for Marcus, you could put either Menachem, Moshe, Mendel, nothing. One night, in those days, I used to sleep soundly a whole night. I couldn't sleep. I feel this something, Ruach. And there's like a voice says to me, you know why you can't find him? Because his name is Mayer. <laughs> I got up and I ran to the computer. I sent my son an email over this. In 20 minutes, he found it, Mayer and Zelig. Wow. <laughs> I never knew the guy's name was Mayer. We didn't know anything at all. But he came from the Olim Hammers to tell me what his name is. I mean, what's interesting is that actually the Catholics in their Bible, you know, they add actually different stuff. And so in their book of Esther, uh, we don't have the mention of a actually, but they have actually that Mordecai had a, a dream or a prophecy. Of, 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 so well, apparently, they must have gotten it from the, um, of our sources and, and made it into like a whole dramatic thing to put into their Bible. Interesting. <laughs> it's a story of the Tzemach Tzedek over here on this passage, verse 7. When Mordecai told Hasach the full account of what happened and the silver that Haman proposed to weigh out to the king's treasuries on the Jews' account to cause him to perish. The way the word Yehudim, Jews, is written in the Megillah, it's with two Yuds over here. Ba Yehudim, with the two Jews. At the end of the Megillah, when it says, La Yehudim Isa and the Jews had light, it is written, La Yehudim, with one Yud. So how come over here the word Yehudim is written, Yehudim, Jews, by the decree, is written with two Yuds? And the word Yehudim, when by the celebration of the salvation, and when they were saved, has one Yud. La Yehudim, to the Jews, there was light. So in Apikaris, you know what Apikaris is? A heretic. A heretic. An enlightened Jew, mm -hmm. <laughs> a self-declared intellectual atheist. <laughs> he asked this question to the Semach Sadiq. Yeah. The Semach Sadiq answered him like this. The letter Yud co corresponds to the ten koichas, the ten powers of the person's nisham, of the person's soul. <laughs> Every single Jew has a godly soul and an animal soul. The godly soul has ten powers, ten spheres, and the animal soul, Nefesh Bahamis, has ten powers as well. Letter Yud corresponds to those ten. There are some Jews who act the way their Nefesh Alekis, their godly Jew wants, their godly soul wants them to act. There are some Jews who act according to the Yud of the Nefesh Bahamis, of their animal soul. The decree of Haman was on every type of Jew. He didn't discriminate. Hmm. If you were a Jew who kept, who lived up to the standard of Yehudim, a Jew, what a Jew should be, according to your godly soul, 
Or if you were a Jew, which listened to Yetzirah, and you lived up to the Yud of your animal soul, the ten powers of your animal soul. But Hitler, Hitler did care. Very good. <laughs> So that so uh, Haman didn't discriminate. His decree was against every type of Jew. So then this uh, heretic a scoffer asked the Samach Sadek, if so, when it says that Jews in Shushan um, gathered together and they wanted to fight uh, the enemies, it has two Yuds. So the Samach Sadek answers like this. A Jew who lived in Shushan felt very clearly the danger, and he felt the miracle. So in Shushan, every single Jew did a complete turnaround. Even a Jew, which was very far from listening to his godly soul, Jew was very far from godliness. Even then, they turned around and felt the Kedusha. <laughs> and the Tzemach Sedek told them the same thing. To you, when you will have, God forbid, sufferings and in your life, Yisurim, pains in your life, you also will change. And that's what happened. This heretic, for three months, later on, he became very, very sick. Later on, he made a complete turnaround, he became a Yerushalayim, a God-fearing person, and he became a completely new person. Nice story. Story, it was a free decree, said, over in 1942. Hmm. And to, to, to the Rebbe one time explained a little bit of the depth of the story. Haman didn't discriminate. He felt a Jew is a Jew no matter what you do. Whether a Jew who acted in a way befitting for a Jew or a Jew who didn't act in a way befitting for a Jew. Well, fundamentally, that's true. Fundamentally, a, a, when a, when a non-Jew hates it, um, has a sin, a, a, a hatred, it's because of Hashem's Atta Bechartonu Mikolamim. You have chosen us from all the peoples. It doesn't take into account what the person is like, what he asks, or what he acts like. Just because we are who we are, we're chosen by Hashem. And that causes the nations of the world to despise and not to like the Jews. So the the, the non-Jew could feel if a Jew is different than him. We've seen by just, you know, by, by, by Nazi Germany, by, by Hitler, they chased after Jews, even if they were for generations separated from Yiddishkeit, from Judaism. And Many people didn't even know they were Jewish and they were given a rude awakening if they're actually Jewish. Because a Jew is different in essence, essentially different than a non-Jew. And a non-Jew could recognize and feel that right away, even someone who's very far from Torah and Mitzvahs. So, so through decrees, bad decrees, and uh, the decrees of Haman, the Jewish people did Teshuvah and returned to Hashem. Actually, by the Nuremberg laws, um, many of the people that didn't see the king were actually blamed. Right, they have one Jewish grandparent. One, and the, that was the grandfather. Right, anyone from the uh, if anyone from the father's side, they're not Jewish, mm -hmm. and even from the mother's side, if it's a father, it's not Jewish. Mm -hmm. Right. They had an opportunity to go to this place, uh, Vansi. They made all these rules over there. Honestly, you went, yeah, you went there. Went there. I would put in filling many, many people there. Mm -hmm. went, you went to what? Did you go to the big campus? I went to the mikveh every day, but not specifically. <laughs> That's right. No, I had said that President of Israel, after he came out from meeting the Pope, he told the Shara, he says, get me to a mikveh. Right. That's, I think it's a little different. That's Tuma. It's just Klippa. <laughs> saying, um, saying that's an actual way to Zara. Here is just a lot of anti Semitism took place in this place. If you look at the words of the, of the Megillah over here, it says, V'yagele Mordechai eis kol asher karahu. Mordechai told him everything that happened to him. To him karahu. What do you mean happened to him? Mordechai actually was not in really a great danger. As an officer of the king and a relative of Esther, he could have saved himself. He didn't. He wasn't really in, in danger from being from the decree. But he says to Ahasach, everything that happened to him, when a trouble happens to another Jew, he felt that it was happening to him. When you meet a Jew who's missing something, it's not enough just to help them out. But we even learned from Mordechai that you actually have to feel like it's happening to yourself. You have to experience it for yourself. Later on, Mordechai tells Esther, 
Ki macharesh tacharishi ba'es hazais. If you will only listen to me at this time, don't think that just because you're in the king's palace, you will escape. If you remain silent at this time, the rescue and a relief will arise to the Jews from somewhere else. This line was used by the Rebbe Marash in the 1879 and 1880 when there were uh, the pogroms and decrees against the Jews in Russia. And first, the Rebbe Marash tried doing everything in Petersburg, in the capital city of Russia, to stop it, and nothing was being done. He made no headway. He traveled to France and Germany, looked up the biggest Jewish bankers, and caused that the governments threatened the uh, Russian government that if you keep on um, persecuting the Jews and make, letting pogroms happen, we're going to stop doing business with Russia. When Reb Maras traveled back to um, Russia, the Russian government was very angry at him. And instead of going back to Lubavitch or trying to hide, he went straight to Petersburg, to the capital city. And he called a meeting of all the uh, rich and uh, noble Jews in the city of Petersburg, Baron Ginsburg and other noble Jews and big Jews. And told them, um, there's decrees against the Jewish people, there's pogroms against the Jewish people, and we have to stop it. And I want all of you together with me. Uh, I want to choose three, three of you should come with me. And we're going to have a meeting with the czar, uh, us together. And they told him, Reb Marash, <laughs> you should know that you shouldn't even be here. You're in big, big danger. From our contacts that we speak to, the entire government is very angry at you. And because you're bringing so much foreign pressure against the Russian government, and how could they do it? And you should really get away from here and not try doing anything, and we are definitely not going with you. So Reb Marash told him like this, Hashem will send the salvation. Whether you could have the schus, the merit of being part of it, or you won't have the merit of being part of it. If you're too scared to go meet the czar, I'm going to take three of my chassidim with me. They are not scaredy cats. They have no fear. And we will go together. And then Marash left and tried getting a meeting with the czar. Instead, he got a meeting with an interior minister. Mm -hmm. He took two of his chassidim, and each of them described the meeting of the Rebbe Marash, came in very rich clothes, as, as he used to do, and fearless, and he would talk to the interior minister. interior minister was very respectful, started talking to him how you got us all angry and upset, the government, and uh, what you did. And he says, and we shouldn't be angry and upset, the Jewish people, and we have no rights. Mm -hmm. you go, how we should let our women, our wives and children get killed and our property be destroyed, and we can't fight back. And um, he was very uh, firm with interior minister, interior minister didn't know what to answer him, told him I'll get you back to you in two weeks. <laughs> but they, from then on, a decree was given out to all the different government the areas, the Tepsk and these places to, to protect the Jews and anyone who starts up with the Jews um, will be punished. And then all the pogrom stopped. Mm, nice. So the idea that <laughs> Rebbe Chatzala, 1879 and 1880. Mm. And said this Russia wanted to look like he was enlightened, but over here, it's, it's, very enlightened. He said over here, when the entire the Russia, yeah. less than a thousand, uh, less than I think two hundred miles of paved roads in all Russia, and the rest of Europe was already far ahead in eighteen eighty. With <laughs> hey, but I'm saying, so Russia wanted to, to at certain times, Russia wanted to give the impression that it's very enlightened, but the period is very specific. You're so enlightened. What are you doing with the Jews over here? Right, but well, they're upset for for yeah. the news to get out. Yeah, Esther tells Achashverosh. Esther tells Mordechai, I'm too scared to go to Achashverosh because whoever goes to the king without permission and he comes to the inner courtyard, right away they'll be killed if without permission unless the king tells them, uh, stretches out his scepter. Mordechai tells her back, you should know that if you don't join and do what you could to save the Jewish people, first of all, the Jews will be saved in a different way. And second of all, you and your father's, ha father's house will be lost. Everything will be lost. Third of all, and who knows whether 
you became a queen just for this moment. This is your moment, and this is why Hashem put you here to become a queen. Now, I have a very big question. Mordechai is a head of Sanhedrin, the leader of the Jewish people. Mordechai tells her, go into the king and intercede for the Jewish people. You got to listen to him, no matter what he says. If you don't listen to the sages, it's, it's, uh, we know the, the, the strong um, punishments it says about them. Mordechai, she should listen right away to Mordechai. Why does Mordechai have to go back and forth with her? And why does Mordechai have to warn her so strongly? You and your father's house will all be lost. And why does he have to add on the last thing? And who knows whether you became a queen just for this moment. And if she still doesn't want to go to the king, what does this explanation help? So we, we know from the Malshem joke. He says, and Neshama comes down for 70 or 80 years to this world just in order to do a favor for one other person. Physical favor or a spiritual favor. That's a purpose. A person could learn Torah, do mitzvahs, do many good things for many years. The purpose could be to do one favor for one person for one time. There was one time I, someone wrote a letter to the Rebbe saying that um, I give a shir in public. And even though the people of the shir enjoy the shir, mm. sounds familiar? <laughs> Even the people this year enjoy this year, but it takes up so much of my time. It takes um, up uh, it's twice a week, and each time it takes half, it takes up half a day. I, I, I want to give it up. The Rebbe says, I, "I'm really don't understand this whole thing because in the uh, Chassidus explains and explains in, in, in the words of our sages, especially the Balshemtiv says that Neshama could come down for seventy or eighty years to do a favor for one person." This physical favor or spiritual favor. So now you still have a doubt if it's worth it once, half a day, twice a week, in order to help many Jews, tens of Jews, to bring them closer to Torah and Yiddishkeit. For sure, you're going to not just continue, but you're going to add in this. Every single person, every single Jew has a special part, a special part of the Torah, which they are more connected to. And every Jew has one mitzvah which they are very connected to throughout their life. Some people build mikvahs. Some people visit the sick. Some people, maybe like Dovi, mm -hmm. do Havaya Sameh, to take care of, uh, of those who passed away. Mm -hmm. Every Jew has a mitzvah, of Zahir Tve, which they are careful, which they are connected to. So this, we could explain the conversation between Mordechai and Esther. Mordechai tells Esther, go to the queen, go to the king. Esther answers, um, I'm not allowed to go to the king according to the Torah because now I will be prohibited to you forever. I'm not allowed to willingly submit myself to the king. Mordechai says you are allowed to because you are here to save the Jews. Esther says I wasn't called to the king in 30 days. Meaning there's no natural means of me to save the Jews. And on the contrary, according to the natural means, I'm going to be killed. And Mordechai says you and your father's house will be lost. True, according to the Torah, you only have to go in the natural manner. And all these explanations are valid if according to the logic of the Torah. But Mordechai says, we hear when you have a, a uh, the head of Sanhedrin tells you to do a certain mission, this is your purpose in the world. This is something which is beyond logic. And Mordechai says, who knows if this is why you came. When Esther heard from the head of Sanhedrin that this is her purpose, why she came down to the world, why she came to the house of Achashredesh, even though it's against the logic, which you would think logically from the Torah, <laughs> the main thing is to fulfill what Mordecai does. <laughs> and therefore, Esther should not make any personal calculations or agendas. So a person can learn a lesson from this. When you have an opportunity to meet somebody else, bring them closer to Torah, teach them Torah, do a mitzvah with them. A person could say, I was never called to the king. I don't have any influence with this person. I can't help change that person. Better I shouldn't get involved. Leave it for the experts. I'm going to have my own good life of learning Torah and davening. And that's what 
we hear, who knows if for this time you became a king. It's possible that your whole the reason why you were in this world is only in order to bring another Jew closer to Torah and Mitzvah. And that is your purpose. And that is why he got to Lamalchus, he became a king. We are the sons of Hashem, the king. If a person says, I lived such a long life, I did so many mitzvahs, I learned so much Torah, none of that is worth it in comparison to doing one favor for another Jew. So then we tell them, you, to you, might look like one, like a small thing, doing a favor, helping out another yid. But it could be, this is why you're here. And this is why your entire neshama came down to this world. At the very end, he says, Esther tells uh, Mordechai, gather all the Jews in Shushan, fast for three days, and me and my, and my maidens, my girls, will fast in a similar manner. And I will come to the king, contrary to the law, and if I die, I will die. Why did Esther's not Roisai, why did her maidens, her maidservants, why did they have to fast? Esther should fast. The Jews should fast. Why did Esther have to fast? Well, why do maidens, um, maidservants need to fast? If they're non-Jews. So three short answers that the Rebbe once gave to this question. First of all, how is it any different? In Nineveh, um, everybody in Nineveh, when Yonah, when Jonah went to Nineveh to tell them to uh, do tshuva, Hashem will destroy Nineveh. Nineveh is actually... They're currently inside in Iraq in the city of Mosul. The city of Nineveh is surrounded in, in, on all sides. Um, he says that everybody fasted, including the behema. Even, even the animals fasted. Meaning the men, the women, and the children. So it's not any worse than Nineveh if they're a decree of, 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 an, of destruction. In addition, um, perhaps her maidservants were Eved Ivri. They were um, Eved Kanani. They had the law of a uh, non-Jewish servant which has to keep some mitzvahs. And there's a Megillah star in a certain sefer which says that they actually she had Jewish maidservants. Mm -hmm. What was the last thing you said? She, uh, the maidservants were actually Jewish mm -hmm. according to the Megillah star. It's called the, the, the secret squirrel. Why is it called Tainus Esther, the fast of Esther, if all the Jews fasted? And another question I have is we fast for one day. The fast of Esther was how many days? Three days. Three days. So the Buddha Ram, he's a Rishon, times of the Barba now, and he says that the fast that we fast today, Tainus Esther, is not commemorating the fast of three days. And also that was on Pesach, if you remember. That's when the three days were. They weren't on uh, in the month of other. The fast, Tainus Esther, is a commemoration for the fast that took place on the 13th of other, when the Jews had to gather to fight their enemies. So why is it called Tainus Esther? All the Jews had to fast. Why is it called the fast of Esther? Megillah is called Megillah's Esther, Megillah of Esther, because Esther was the one who pushed the Chacham and the sages to write down the Megillah. But why call the fast on the name of Esther, Tainus Esther? So it was a very simple answer you could give, not a complicated answer. There's a halacha that when you're going to war, you're not allowed to fast when you're going to a war. Why? Because if you fast, you're not going to have strength and power. And if a Jew is fighting a war, you're not allowed to fast, even if it's a fast day. In order to, because you have to be strong, you have to have power. So it comes out that on the fast of Esther and the 13th of, of, of other, Esther was actually the only one who fasted. Because all the Jews in all 127 countries, on the 13th of other, they had to fight their enemies. That was a decree of the king. The, the, the enemies are allowed to destroy the Jews. And the king made a second decree later on, the Jews could protect themselves. They had a war to fight. When you're fighting a war, you're not allowed to fast. You're not allowed to uh, make yourself not feel um, weak. The only one who didn't have to fight a battle on that day was Esther. Why? Because Esther's in the palace. She's protected by the king's army, the king's soldiers, the king's men. So since Esther was the only one who was allowed to fast, and consequently she was the only one who actually fasted on the 13th of other. 
So that's why it's called Tainus Esther, the fast of Esther. Now, Esther, when she wants to come and impress the king, what does she do? She fasts for three days. She herself. Isn't that sort of counterintuitive? I want to impress the king. I should look beautiful. I should look um, vigorous. So why did Esther fast? In addition, it says Mordechai, it says in the Madras, she gathered 22,000 children. And he taught them Torah. And they fasted together with him for three days. And um, in Slichus, in Tainus Esther, we do say, Mordechai gathered the children in front of him and they were thirsty and hungry. The children came with Mordechai. He was teaching them Torah and he was fasting and they were fasting. Why did Mordechai tell the kids to fast? can't be chinuch. Usually when a child, we say we fast several hours, we say to teach them they should get used to fasting when they get older on a fast day. First of all, these were children who were learning Torah. Learning Torah starts at age six or seven. You don't teach children to fast usually till age 12. And it depends not on how smart you are, it depends how strong you are, how strong the child is, how healthy they are. And even then you don't fast the whole day. You fast just a few hours when a child is younger. Not for three days. Second of all, the meditator says that the, um, says Haman came to, to, to Mordechai and all the, um, Mordechai told the children, run away. Um, Haman's coming. And they said, no, we are not leaving you. We are together with you. The mothers of the children came and told them, please come home and eat something. And the children said, no, we are staying here with Mordechai. We are not going anywhere. Mordechai is not eating or drinking. We will stay with Mordechai and not eat or drink. And they swore on their Sefer Torah that we will never leave Mordechai. And they started crying out loud. And it says that Hashem heard the cries of the 22,000 children. And at that time, Hashem tore up all the written decrees in Shemayim in heaven. So if the fast was only a fast of to, to, to teach children and to train them to start fasting, that wouldn't have broken up the decrees in Shemayim. wouldn't have been more powerful. It says Hashem ripped up the decrees on the fast of the children, not the fast of the adults. So obviously it wasn't the chinuch idea of, 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 uh, of education. And in general, there's an idea. There's a story of, of a certain god, I think it was... Um, not sure, maybe a stipler going. When he was a child, on Yom Kippur, his father in the middle of Musaf turned around to him and told him, go home and eat something. He was a child who was a big learner. So he went home, he ate, and he came back to his father half an hour later in Shul. So his father asks him, tell me, did you make Kiddush when you, when you, uh, when you ate? It's Yom Kippur. It's a Yom Tiv, you got to make Kiddush. <laughs> told him, no, I didn't make Kiddush. He says, why not? He says, because the whole idea of a minor, someone under Baran Bas Mitzvah, to do a mitzvah, to do mitzvahs is only mitzad chinuch. Chinuch is education, to learn how to do a mitzvah, to practice doing a mitzvah when you're an adult. But over here, when I'm an adult, on Yom Kippur, I'm going to be fasting, not making Kiddush. <laughs> so there's no need for me to practice making Kiddush on Yom Kippur because I'm not going to be making Kiddush when I'm an adult on Yom Kippur. His father was very pleased with the answer. <laughs> So over here, this is not a regular fast day. This is a fast day for a special occasion. For the tshuva, the Jewish people um, were, were, were turning to Hashem. There's no need to, to have the children fast, to practice, to learn such that they should fast on this day. It's not a fast they're going to have when they grow up. So you must say that it wasn't chinuch. It wasn't teaching, training the children to fast. Rather, it was an obligation, a chiyav that they had. The children had to fast. How did the Jews return to Hashem and abolish the decree? It was only with mysterious nefesh, going beyond logic, going beyond any understanding that they had. 
it brings in Svarim to her as well, that if the Jews would have agreed to, 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 to convert the religion, Haman wouldn't have had an issue with them. He only had a decree on Yehudim. Yehudim are those who deny idol worship. They would have changed their religion. He would have saved them. But his whole argument was here you have the people, they have their own laws. And Correct. So, so, so if the Jews said, oh, we're, we're going to do everything for you, uh, uh, um, it would have it removed all of his arguments. Right. <laughs> And if one of them would have, but not even one Jew, the entire year, even once, um, had a thought to, 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 to change religion, God forbid. So there's no difference in that. And this, when it, the only difference between a, a child and an adult is when it comes to logic, how much they understand. When it comes to above understanding, beyond logic, then adults and children are the same. And in order to get rid of the decree, of Haman, you need Mesir Snefesh, literal self-sacrifice. So not just, and, and in this, the children have an advantage over the adults because adults have a lot of understanding and it's harder for them to have self-sacrifice, to go beyond their logic, to go beyond their understanding. The children have, a, have an advantage over here. And in this sense, the adults have to be like children. And therefore, the children also have to fast over there because... The idea of mysterious nefesh, self-sacrifice, applies equally by children and by adults. And once you have that, you can explain, why did Esther fast for three days before coming to the king? She wants to find favor in the king's eyes. Because the decree over here was not a decree according to Seichel, according to understanding. It wasn't a natural type of thing. Ahasuerus was a king. He hated the Jews, he says, even more than Haman. It's remarkable. <laughs> and he never, thought of, he never thought of this great idea of making a decree to kill all the Jews. It was only Haman who did it. So this whole thing was not a natural thing. And Jews, in general, we don't live a natural life. And if a person looks at their own life, not in the short term, but in the long term, look at the last five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and see... You'll see how everything works out never in a way that you thought or expected. Hashem runs a show in, in, in miraculous ways. And always, he's always proving that he's smarter than you. <laughs> Not just that. If you, the only time you get into trouble is when you mix in your own seichel. <laughs> right? Hashem is a shepherd who guards us. There's 70 wolves around the sheep, surrounding the sheep. Jews among the 70 nations of the world. And the shepherd, Hashem, protects us. So if you wanted to get, if you wanted to uh, fight the decree was only, was not through acting in logical ways, wasn't getting APAC and lobbyists to start, uh, you know, making um, lobbying campaigns and whining and dining the ministers. That's not the way to save yourself from the decree of Haman. And that's also not the way to save yourself from hatred of the non-Jews, of the Goyim, of the nations of the world. It's not the way to do it. In Eretz Yisrael, whenever they try showing how diplomatic they are, that's when they usually get into trouble. And when do they not get into trouble in the rest of the world? When you say, this is a land which Hashem gave to us, and this is our people, and we're protecting our people. Too bad. Then you don't get into trouble. When you try going in a way of logic, remember you're a wolf among 70 nations. Everything that we do has to be done but only because Torah said so. And Torah said you have to do a natural um, type of shtadlos, a natural type of keli, siba, it's called, some type of thing. So this is what Esther did. She went to Achashverosh and got dressed up before she went to Achashverosh, but she didn't put her eggs in that basket. Her main, ass, her main focus was on the fasting and the tshuva, three days straight, even if it will naturally weaken her body and, 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 and weaken her beauty. Because what's important here is if the tshuva is proper, done properly, then Hashem will send the Yeshua. Just putting on natural, uh, beautiful garments and beautiful clothes was well, because you have to do a natural means because Hashem wanted, wants us to do a natural means. Same thing it comes when it comes to Parnassah. Earning money. When we, everything we do to earn money a living, we could work very, very hard at it. 
But we know, as we're learning in Kuntur Sumayin, now at length, we're only going to earn what Hashem has decreed for us on Rosh Hashanah. We're not going to earn a penny more with the biggest amount of effort that you do. Not to earn, also not going to earn a penny less. We just learned that every day you have to act properly in order for Hashem to bring that uh, parnasa down every, um, every day. When it comes to learning Torah as well, those who have the opportunity to learn Torah, um, it's not enough if someone is naturally very smart, like uh, just really. <laughs> However, um, a yeah, person has to, that's a big plus to learn Torah. But also you need your Shemayim, fear of heaven, when you're learning Torah. Torah is not merely another science, another um, school of intellectual exercise. Yer Shemayim is fear of heaven. That causes you to learn Torah much more. So the letter that Rebbe writes to somebody is that putting too much effort into your job, not just that it doesn't not going to make you earn more money because any even if you earn more money, that money if you weren't meant to earn it, it's going to be spent on non healthy things. But more than that, it makes it that you that the money you're supposed to earn is going to take more time to get to you. Well, the fact that we do physical, uh, we have to do something in order to earn our money is because the Torah told us, you have to do something. But we're doing it not because we think this thing is what actually earning us the money. We're doing it only because Torah says you have to do something that, um, that, that, that can make you earn it. But if you, uh, let's say you're a size six or size eight or 10, and just to be on the safe side, I go to the store, just to be on the safe side, I'm going to buy a size 14. Just to make sure that it's a, uh, <laughs> that it fits will it fit yeah it will fit but it'll probably drag on the floor too All right so working more than you're supposed to meaning having that as your focus it's not going to make it come any faster or any quicker as opposed to because a jew knows that everything our lives are not natural are not natural we are super natural and we go above and we see this in the children of Shushan. The children of Shushan, they're the ones who made the miracle of Shushan, made the miracle of Purim. Mordechai, trying to get, Mordechai finds out about the decree. How, what does he do to make, to get rid of the decree? What does he do? He goes to the most powerful allies, most powerful advocates, most, power, most powerful lobbyist group that the Jewish people have. Who is that? The children. Mordechai gathers 22,000 children. And Mordechai put all of his eggs in that one basket. And he put all of his hopes on the children. And he says, the children, they will, um, they will, they will uh, tear up the heavens. The children, they're going to make their parents do teshuva. They're going to awaken the inner Jew in, inside of their parents. In our generation, we'll conclude with this, a lesson we can learn from this. Do you want to know what the future of the Jewish people are? We got to focus on one thing, on the children. Are they, their belief in Hashem, their trust in Hashem, especially when they go home. We have family, children, grandchildren, people around the block. From a, from a young age, we have to teach children not to be scared of anybody besides Hashem. When Mordechai, Wanted to know what's will, um, what will happen. He asked the children going back from school, "Tell me a pasuk you learned." And the first child said, "Al tira mi pachar pisam." Those of you who daven in Balshem Tov Shul get to sing this every day. Al tira mi pachar pisam. And the first child told him, "Don't be scared." And from the noise of a rush of the evil doers, the second um, child told him, "Utsuets of a our enemies will make lots of plans and they're all going to be abolished. Nothing will happen. Hashem is with us. Third child said, Even in my old age, Hashem will always be with me. So that's a way to, to raise a child. You know, the Baal Shem Tev was very young. His father passed away. His father was a very big hidden tzaddik. His name was Rebbe Eliezer. And his father told him, don't be scared 
of anybody or anything besides for Hashem. And throughout his life, he lived with that very, very strongly. When a child grows up, he explain to them what it means to believe in Hashem, not to be scared of the world, of the people in the world, or the world itself that will stop you. So it's not enough to have just psukim from the Torah. You have to tell the child, tell me psukecha, tell me what you learned. Tell me how you're living, you're experiencing the Torah. And that's what we say in Tehillim. If you want to destroy your enemies and those who are trying to avenge themselves on the Jews, from the mouths of the babes and toddlers, he said to us. That's how we have his strength. We're not even talking about children who are able to learn Torah. Those who are nursing from their mother can't even talk, generally. And the, or even if they talk until uh, whatever age, age of two, but uh, they, um, right? They're, they're not the ones who are the ones saying the words of Tehillim, the words of Torah. How could they destroy our enemies? Because they are the ones of the strongest Muna and Bitachan and belief in Hashem. The Rebbe writes in a letter to somebody. You're writing about a big worry about your health and your wife's health and about your parnasa as well. The Rebbe says, I, where does this come from? You, you specifically, you. I'm, I'm surprised by, by the tone. Have you seen so many miracles you personally experienced over and over? Hashem saved you in the camps, in the concentration camps, again and again. You've seen so many miracles in your own personal life. You write to me in your letter, I in Yavai Ezri, from where will my help come? The answer is in the next words. You forgot to write on, Ezri Mim Hashem, my help comes from Hashem. That's right. Now, although I can't judge you until I experience what you're experiencing, I just want to, uh, the Rebbe says, I want to explain the situation the way it is. And then you're going to see, if you think about this for a few moments, how strong your belief in Hashem, the Hashem who creates the world and constantly runs the world every single second, and the stronger your, your belief and trust in Hashem is, the stronger you will see the blessings from Hashem. And especially, you'll see it, he says, when you're trying to find money to make a parnasa, the other person could feel how calm you are when you're applying for a job. And your trust in Hashem will make you calm. That it's, that, that you're going to see that how it will have an effect. And you see clearly, do what you have to do in a, in a regular means, but the important is to add on in your spiritual DNA, adding on learning Torah, adding on in every mitzvah that you do. That's a real way to bring down the blessings from Hashem and what's needed. So Shukayach for joining mm -hmm. and for having a Fabrengi and explaining the, the Maras, pointing to Chassidus and explaining many other um, aspects of the Gemara. Um, and Mr. Hashem will continue tomorrow with uh, 10.30 with Rabbi Darren. Shukayach for joining. Mm -hmm. Thank you.